Have you ever wondered, what do these people know that I don't know? How do I do it? How do I find my purpose, my passions? What if you could sit down with some of the wisest experts, everyday leaders, and inspirational people who could answer your deepest questions? That is what we do here on the Inspirational Living Podcast. We invite you to join us as we hold conversations, share wisdom, tips, and tools to inspire you, ignite your passions and vision for your life, to awaken your sense of purpose and hope, and leave you inspired to design your best life. Join me, your host, psychologist Dr. Sean Horn, as we take you on an inspirational, motivational, and educational journey so you can inspire by living an inspired life. It is an honor and privilege to have with us today Todd Jacobs and Dr. Peter Lynn. For the past 15 years, Todd and Peter have worked together to prepare hundreds of individuals to develop a mature, idealistic vision of marriage as the primary vehicle to create wholeness, meaning, purpose, and happiness in our lives. They have been working to perfect the character issues that lie at the core of what it means to be a successful spouse. Their work combines the practical and mystical Jewish wisdom with positive psychology and all their experience accrued through years of real-world implementation and practice. Their insights and work applies to all of us regardless of relationship status, age, or stage in life. Their book, Not a Partnership, Why We Keep Getting Marriage Wrong and How We Can Get It Right, will help all of us to flourish in our relationships. Let me give you a little background on our guests before we get started. Todd Jacobs is the founder and director of the David Robinson Institute of Jewish Heritage in Jerusalem. Prior to his current role teaching and counseling his students and alumni, he enjoyed a distinguished career on Wall Street as a leading authority on the telecommunications industry. His background in finance and investigative journalism earned him a nomination for a Pulitzer Prize and an Emmy Award. Dr. Peter Lin has served also at the David Robinson's Institute in, of Jewish Heritage as the Dean of Students. He holds a Master's in Applied Positive Psychology and a Doctorate in Human and Organizational Psychology. Peter lectures at Truro College in Jerusalem. He is founder and director of the Greatness Within Seminars, where he helps empower individuals and organizations through the application of positive psychology. Both Peter and Todd live in Jerusalem with their families, where they join us today. I have quickly become a big fan of their work. I have listened to every podcast they have been on. I've watched all their videos and read their book, and I share with them a passion for positive psychology, the pursuit of wisdom, and the desire to equip others with practical tools to build a successful life. I think all of you would agree that there's plenty of information out there that tells us what's wrong. They explain the why, why we are the way we are and what the problems are, but the missing link is the next step of what is the actual steps we can take to improve those situations. Todd and Peter's book offers this practical guide to not only improve our relationships, but to go beyond and begin the journey of building a rewarding relationship. I am honored to have these esteemed guests on the show today, and I'm delighted to share this wisdom with you. So please welcome Todd and Peter, and let's get started with our interview. Let's begin and tell us the journey of writing, not a partnership. Why this title? Why this book? So the, the title is, uh, let, let me give you a, a, a short story for or how we get this title, because it's a strange title. Most people think that marriage is exactly a partnership, right? I mean, it's you know, a partnership. The problem is that most partnerships in the world don't work very well. And this was a discussion that I wound up having with one of our students that uh, Peter and I spent some time with when he was um, at the institute that we co-teach in. Very fine young man, late 20s, uh, married to a lovely young lady. The two of them, for all of their goodwill and all of their talent and all of their success, every place else in life, basically failing in their relationship. And I was sitting on the Upper West Side one day having a coffee with, uh, with my student he said to me, you know, I try and, you know, as much as I do, you know, she doesn't respond and this and that. And he said, and I, I just don't know what to do anymore because, I'm, you know, as much as I'm doing, I don't find that she is responding in the way that she should and she doesn't do things for me anymore. And she doesn't care about me anymore. So I said to him, the problem you have here is that 
you have a completely wrong paradigm that you're working with for what a good marriage or a good relationship is all about. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you think that marriage is a partnership. I said, marriage is, isn't the, is not a partnership. He said, what are you talking about? Of course it's a partnership. I said to him, based upon this, again, this is based upon my business background. I said to him, listen, in the world of partnerships, in the world of business, uh, most partnerships fail. And the reason that most partnerships fail is not because they have a bad product, not because they don't have enough financing or funding, and not because they don't have good marketing. The reason that they fail is because a partnership is usually made up of a couple of people, each of whom enters this relationship feeling, I've got my rights and responsibilities, you've got your rights and responsibilities, and I'm always looking at myself as though I'm doing my job, and I'm always looking over your shoulder thinking you're not doing your end of the bargain. And that resentment builds and builds and builds, and almost every partner in every partnership feels that way, and most partnerships break up as a result of that and not because it's a bad business. So I said to him, you're still looking at marriage as I've got my rights and, your, and my responsibilities. And what are you doing for me? I did X for you. Why aren't you doing Y and Z for me? I said, you have, to, you have to stop focusing on her end of things and focus on your own end and what you're bringing to the table. I said, so it's not a partnership. And he said to me, not a partnership. He said, you have to write a book on that. <laughs> and, that was, and that was, and he said, you have to title it, not a partnership. That is so, so great. <laughs> so the truth is, it is the most amazing partnership that it can exist in the universe, but only if you treat it in the proper way. If you treat it like most people treat partnerships, you're doomed because you're always looking at what your spouse is not or your other, your significant other is doing or not doing for you and always feel like you're doing your part. Yes. And all our psychology books talk about that self-serving bias that we see things more in our favor, that we work harder than they are and do more than they do. And so there's often that comparison that happens there. Right. What you're mentioning is that marriage is a very confusing concept. I've heard you talk about how people are not prepared for marriage and this paradigm you're talking about or mindset of what is a marriage. There's so many different opinions on that and different books written on it that there's no wonder people People are confused about this concept. So share with us how you define marriage. So I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, this is Peter. You know, we define marriage as the opposite of how Todd just described it. Todd just described it as here's what I need and are you, you know, and here's what I'm bringing to the table and let me look what the other person is doing. Marriage is the opposite of that. Marriage is my 100% investment in someone else's well-being and them having the life that they want, and them feeling like they are flourishing, I am going to do everything I can to give my spouse all that she needs so that she can feel totally complete, and she can feel like she has everything that she needs in her life. And that is going to be done with total devotion and total integrity, and that is what I commit to. When I stood under the wedding canopy, I don't care what race or religion you're a part of, when you say the words, I do, that's what you are saying, I do. Like, that is what you're, what you're giving over. You know, that's what you're committing to. And my wife, she committed to the same thing. And when you have now two people whose main mission in life is in someone else's well-being, that is everything but a partnership. Mm -hmm. And when you have two people who are looking at, you know, a relationship that way, that will not just allow you to gain more than anything else you could possibly gain in any sort of relationship, but it'll allow you also to be as resilient as possible as a couple to be able to make it through life's difficulties as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we describe what a marriage is and like how Todd said, what a marriage is not. Sometimes we have to sell people on that, on why they would make that kind of commitment, what the benefits of that, what those are. So how, how would you sell someone on that? Why should they make their partner the 100% devotion to serve them and to uplift them and be there for them? I, I think we can answer that both sort of theoretically and with actual research. It seems that really there is no more miserable person in this world than a selfish person. The person where it's all about me becomes a small, like desiccated human being over a period of time. The person who, who makes life about giving becomes, I mean, there's a, there's a beautiful concept uh, that we talk about in the world of kind of Jewish mysticism, that the more things you put on your shoulders, the bigger you become. 
the bigger your stature becomes. And so the idea of taking responsibility and of giving to an other is the greatest way to expand the self that exists. The happiest people, and I think Peter can tell you with, you know, with research that they've done, uh, that he's done partly directly and partly indirectly, is that the happiest people tend to people who give, tend to be the people who give the most. And so again, and we're not, by the way, we're not talking about being a martyr. We're not talking about, oh my gosh, I don't matter. And you know, my self-esteem doesn't matter. And my well-being doesn't matter. I talk just all about the other. It's not that at all. It's to the contrary. You, you figure out who you are and how big you are and you expand yourself in the process of investing in another. If I build a house, right? The, the love that I feel for the house is not a function of how nice the house is. It's a function of how much I invested in the house. The plant that I, that I raised, I love the plant that I raised, not because it's a better plant than the one that I can see in the plant show or at the flower shop. I love it because I put myself into it. And the real understanding in terms of the way, the way Jewish mysticism views this whole thing is that you love where you give, not where you get. So if you want to experience love in this life, the way to experience it is to give to the other, expand yourself, invest yourself in the other. Byproduct of that will be a love for the place where you invest, whether it's your house, whether it's your plant, whether it is your, your loved one, your spouse um, in an intimate relationship. I often say to my clients, do you love that person or do you love being loved by that person? There are different approaches to that relationship. Right, for sure. We always ask our students, okay, so you're successful as a lawyer, an accountant, a social worker, an actor, an actress, a this, a that, you're, you're, really, you're really successful in what you do. Okay, you know all about it. What causes love? Let's get to something very basic. How do you, how do you generate love? And you're always met with this kind of like, you know, uncomfortable stare. And people start looking at the ground. And the answer is, you know, again, it's where you give. And the question we usually ask them is, who loves who more? A parent loves a child more? Or the child tends to love the parent more? In a normal, healthy relationship. I mean, after all, the parent is mostly a one-way giving relationship, certainly for tens of years. I'm speaking as a grandparent, okay? It's mostly, it, most of the giving is on the side of the parent or the grandparent to the child, as opposed to the other way around. And yet, who tends to love the other more? And the answer tends to be the parent loves the child much, much more. And so mm -hmm. it's totally counterintuitive to the way, you know, society would view it, which is you give enough to me and I'll love you. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, I give enough to you and I will love you. As I was reviewing your book, Not a Partnership, I saw those statistics in there that you showed the studies that showed how giving and serving and volunteering is so good for our health. And it's just been proven over and over. I remember years ago, I went to a presentation at the American Psychological Association, and there was a gentleman who did research on treatment as usual and what he called good deed treatment in a group home for adolescents to see what the outcomes were. And in the treatment as usual, they had individual therapy, group therapy, and in the good deed therapy, they didn't engage in any therapy but they went and volunteered at an elderly home and an animal place. And the outcome was that the kids that did the volunteering far out benefited from the typical treatment as usual. And wow. that was the first time that I heard that. And that was back in 2000, actually, that I heard that. Mm -hmm. So since then, positive psychology and everything has just proven this over and over. Right. So as you talk about love, I find that people have a really hard time finding it. What is love? Do you have a definition for love? Let me answer your question with one of our paradigms. And what we find is that there are a couple of key paradigms people have to have as far as in order to make your marriage really amazing. And these are some of the paradigms that people get wrong. We normally look at love as the result of just that immediate connection we have with someone or we associate love with wonderful feelings we have. And, you know, people often get quite frustrated in their marriage when they start to feel that love fade in some way. That's usually the sign that, hey, it's not the right person. And what we always tell anyone that we're working with is that great marriages are built and love is not just a result of something. Love is a verb. Love is something that you do in order to create an, amer an amazing marriage. And, you know, just as Todd said very clearly, the way we define love is that the more you give to something, the more you come to love it. The more you invest in something, the more you come to love it. And if you want love to happen, love is something that needs to be built. 
If you're waiting passively for you to experience love, you will be not only very disappointed, but you're never going to get your relationship beyond stage, you know, six weeks. Because at a certain point, like we all know, is that things lose a little bit of, you know, that passion or that initial spark that we once had. And unfortunately, like I said, people live in a world today where you think that, oh, once that's gone, or once we have some sort of issue, must be it's not the right person. And the way we define love is love is a process of continuous giving allows you to love someone more and more. Mm -hmm. And when people have that definition clear as far as what love is, then what can happen is the way you look at not only defining love changes, but you realize that you can actually create and build love. It's not just something that will eventually happen because we're two great people who are in this together. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. I wanted to share with you that before I got married, my husband and I, we've been friends since we were 15. So we've been friends for 36 years, married 26 years. Wow. And before we got married, he said to me, Sean, I need to tell you something. Someday you're going to wake up and you're going to look at me and you're going to go, Oh, why did I marry him? <laughs> and he says, and that's normal because you go through stages and phases in your relationship. And then you'll have another day where you're in love with me again. And I was so horrified. He said that to me and I thought I would never, I wouldn't, you're just so amazing. How could I ever feel that way about you until the day came <laughs> and I turned over and I'm like, Oh, why did I marry him? And then I'm like, this is what he was saying. And I was so <laughs> glad that he pre-warned me because if not, I think I could have gone down a spiral that would have been devastating thinking that maybe this marriage isn't meant for us. And, and I've heard so many people have that confusion about relationship, that it's a feeling that you follow versus guiding your feelings. You're following your feelings. That's right. Yes. And, and just the idea that I fall in love we are, we are literally conditioned from the earliest age to a very passive experience. And then, and then that's compounded with all the love stories that we watch and read about and, and to some extent experience, which is fall in love and the, whether it's the strobe light or whether it's the moonlight or whatever it is, everything is perfect. And they, <laughs> I happen to have seen the old movie Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean. In that movie, Natalie Wood loses her boyfriend in the morning and by nighttime she's with James Dean. She says, you know, I love you. I love you. I really, really, I just love you. I'm so in love with you. And I thought that is the strangest thing I've ever heard. Like that's, <laughs> you know, but okay. But you know, so like if you grow up and you think that's what's called love, which is, you know, the boyfriend gets killed two hours earlier, but James Dean is so good looking and he's kind. So now she's in love with him. Like that, that, I mean, it's, it's almost a joke, but that is how we grow up. And unfortunately, in the movies, you know, the curtain comes, when they fall into each other's arms, the curtain comes down and the movie is over and they're in love. When, in, and, you know, we all know from those of us who've been in married life, the next morning when the curtain comes up, that's when that decision has to be made because, and I think that's what Peter was referring to earlier, you know, you fall in love, you have the magic, whether it's one night or whether it's six weeks or whether it's a couple of months or whatever it is, but then it fades mm -hmm. and the curtain comes back up and now you're not quite as cute as I thought you were. And I'm not as funny as you thought I was. And, you know, it's not all magic and there are financial issues and there's some health issues we didn't talk about and, you know, some responsibilities and, and like, oh my gosh, I, you know, it's happened. Life dealt me the blow again, the wrong person once again. Mm -hmm. But really when the curtain comes back up on that real life scenario, that's that moment where you have to say, I'm going to commit myself to this person. And by the way, not every time is it the right person. But, but, but when it is the right person, it's not going to be magic. It's going to become, I see something in this person. I can respect this person. I get this person. This person gets me. And I think this person is respectful, has a good character. I'm attracted to the person. Now I'm going to start investing and making that happen. Mm -hmm. and, it has good bones, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah, 100%. To build on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can keep, and not only that, but we have a whole chapter in, in, in the book, in the practical section of the book. We go from the theoretical to the kind of practical implementation. And it's all about how to keep those feelings alive to keep the marriage fresh, which is something which also takes work, but can be done. Even people with very, let's call them old marriages in terms of number of years, right, can still have very fresh marriages in terms of the actual dynamic and the love and the feelings that they foster 
through the investment in each other. Many young people who've been married for a very short period of time have what we would call old marriages. They're acting like old middle-aged people in terms of the way that they treat each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not a function of your age. It's a function of your mindset and, and your willingness to invest. Yes. Again, why it's so important to have a, the correct mindset going into relationships. Someone shared with me that there's an old China, Chinese proverb that if you start with a small flame, it can grow into a beautiful fire. But if you start with a big fire, it can die out. Right. And it's that idea that you want those good bones. Uh, do we have the ingredients to build a good relationship on top of or is it not a good match in terms of, you know, some other indicators going on that you got to screen for, but right. if you have those good bones and you start to build it and, and nurture that fire, I always think of the TV show survivor. I'm a crazy survivor fan fan, and they have to start this fire to purify their water. If they don't have fire, they don't have water. And so it's critical and they're constantly feeding it, constantly having someone tend to it, watch over it. Because if it dies out, they have a problem. They have to build it again. And this is a great analogy for relationships. So I love how in your book, Not a Partnership, you talk about what a marriage is, how to position your mind going into the marriage so you have the right idea that there's many different kinds of love, that love is a choice. It's, you know, I tell my clients, I say, you have family members you don't always love, but you love them right? You don't like them, but you love them. And if you can do that with them, you can do that with yourself for self-love and you can do that for others in your life. So it is a choice. It's not always a feeling that we have there. In the second part of your book, you go into the actual steps and you spell out four pillars. So share with us those pillars and what your thoughts are about this. Sure. Maybe uh, it's Todd. I'll do it maybe at a high level and then Peter can you know, dive into one of them if that's, uh, if that's, you know, something you'd like to do. Yeah. At, at a high level, we try to, by, and by the way, all of the pillars are ways to implement giving in the relationship. The pillar is giving, but we really built kind of four approaches that giving can be used to work on various parts of your marriage or various aspects of your marriage. So one of them we call keep it fresh which is how to make sure that your marriage, as I spoke about a couple of moments ago, doesn't become old, doesn't become stale, right? We live in a world where, you know, things become stale very, very quickly. That phone, which looks so good and so new and so amazing to me, like two years ago, I'm embarrassed to have that phone, you know, now because like it's so slow and it's so that tie, you know, that I bought a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh, you know, advertising and the flow of fashions has made me feel very rapidly embarrassed to have it. So we live in a world where things get stale really quickly and marriage right along with that. So keep it fresh is, is, is a number of practical ways to make sure that doesn't happen. A second aspect um, that, we, uh, that we focus on is gratitude. Not just feeling it, but how to express it in all of its forms, how to express it through speech, how to express it through actions, how to express it through non-verbally, verbally. verbally. Uh, when people feel that the other side is showing gratitude and feels gratitude, they want to keep giving. If I, if I give to my spouse, the worst feeling is she didn't appreciate it, she didn't notice it. When my spouse looks to me and says, that was amazing, all I want to do is give more, right? Because the feeling of being appreciated is so powerful and it's such a great motivator. So gratitude is number two. Number three, we call respect in all of its forms, uh, which is to say we go through many, many aspects of how we begin to forget to speak respectfully um, act respectfully, you know, just, we just, that, that, that level of respect that we, that we showed each other when that, when that, when we were just dating, when we first met the way that we, the way I made sure that I looked and smelled and dressed and acted and the types of things I said and didn't say, right. You know, you fast forward and now I'm like laying on the couch with my feet up, you know, and my socks on the floor and, you know, a can of this next to me. And, you know, my, my, my spouse comes in, I don't, I don't look at her, I don't acknowledge her, I'm too busy, you know. And like, what happened to the respect? And what, and what am I communicating through that lack of respect? So respect in all of its forms, that's a whole third pillar. And the last one, which we think is probably the most important pillar, is called, it all depends on me. Which is to say that if I'm going to wait for my spouse to start making things better, and I'm going to be, you know, like this, you know, marking how is she doing or how is he doing or how's the other doing? 
I, I'm going to be waiting probably a very long time until things get better. But if on the other hand, I say, you know, what do I bring to the table? What, am, what problems, what character issues am I bringing to the table that are, that are affecting in a negative way my relationship? And I start working on that irrespective of what my spouse is doing. We have seen people do miraculous things in their relationships by just saying, I'm going to begin the process of change myself, irrespective of my spouse. And so that last one, it all depends on me, is really, in a sense, a cornerstone of the way we look at the, the relationship dynamic. That's very powerful. It pulls for the person to have intrinsic motivations that they are taking this action because of their values versus I'm taking this action because I want to influence you or I'm setting an expectation for you. And if you don't respond how I want, then forget about it, right? But versus saying, I'm doing this because this is how I want to affect things. You have a saying about expectations that you say comes from mystic philosophy. Yeah, one of the, I just, uh, one of the things that I was taught very, very early on is that you should never have expectations of another person that you're not sure in advance that they can meet or exceed. Because otherwise, all you're doing is you're setting yourself up to get angry at the other person and to be disappointed at the other person, which breaks that person down as opposed to building them up. The easiest place to see it is in raising children, right? If I have a child and I'm constantly putting expectations on the child that the child can't meet, what I'm really teaching the child is you just don't live up to, you don't live up to that level that I need you to live up to. You, don't, you just don't make that grade. And every time a child doesn't meet the expectation, not only does that give me the right to, I give myself the right to be angry at them, disappointed in them, but they feel worthless in that moment. Whereas if you can set the bar at a place where you know the kid could jump over it, the kid feels like a hero. And that, that, that's tough in our society to feel heroic mm -hmm. because society in many ways beats us down. And so yes. the more resilience and the more confidence and the more optimism you can create in the other person, the bigger you help them become. And that is a, that's an amazing thing. And that, go, that goes in marriage, that goes in business, that goes in every relationship that we have. It's like expectations, you know, if you look at one of our pillars we discussed, the pillar of gratitude, the thing which gets in the way the most in marriages of being able to express gratitude is we have expectations. You know, I have an expectation that my spouse will do all of these things for me today. And there's a whole long list. And I expect those things will get done. And so what happens is that when do I express my gratitude? When my wife goes like way beyond the call of duty, it's wow. So she gets gratitude for me. But if she goes one little teeny ounce below that line of expectation, I'm a frustrated husband. And it's actually quite interesting that you'll see that, that one of the things that like blocks our gratitude the most, especially in marriages, is because our expectations are so high as far as what should be done for us. And if we took away those expectations, gratitude should be flowing in your marriage to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. People are so confused with expectations. A lot of times they'll resist letting that go because they think if I don't have expectations then you're gonna slack off. So I need to have these high standards. One of the characteristics of toxic shame is having unrealistic expectations that aren't attainable or developmentally appropriate. So we do need to really tackle those expectations or else we get an expectation hangover and we shame others and it's just a hot mess. Before my husband and I got married, we did this premarital workshop and they talked about how their expectations going into marriage said that it caused a problem for them. And they said, in our family, the man said, in my family, when you had a barbecue, the woman did the barbecue. My mom always tended to the barbecue. And she said, when in my family, when you had a barbecue, dad always took care of the barbecue. So our first biggest fight was when we had a barbecue, we invent, invited guests over and I was in the kitchen. I'm waiting for him to barbecue and he was waiting for her to barbecue. And then they go, why aren't you barbecuing? He goes, well, that's your job. What? That's not my job. That's a man's job. That's dad's job. And he goes, no, if women always do that. And they had this huge fight. And so that's a great story to, to talk about like our personal our own personal culture, that even if we're from the same community and the same household, have all the same demographics, we can have very different personal cultures. And so as we communicate those things, 
and get on the same page of how are we going to tackle money? How are we going to do our faith? How are we going to raise our kids? And not assume that that person has that all, all that information, but really have those conversations. It really can help eliminate a lot of those problematic expectations. Absolutely. I love that fourth pillar. It is really gold to have people look at their own part. I know in 12 step programs, they say, don't do another person's recovery. Don't do their inventory. You focus on your own. And when you go to someone say, I need to apologize because here's my inventory. You don't then say, and you have some things to apologize for too, you know, (laughs) and expect that, but instead just be your best self. And that is where it, it has a ripple effect. When we, when we focus on that. So it really is a core principle. I like the definition of love from the, um, in, in the Bible where it says that love is patient, love is kind. But one of the things it says is it doesn't keep a list of wrongs. It doesn't keep a list of everything they've done. And that's been a mantra of mine in my, in my marriage that I always say, don't keep a list. And so we always stick with the issue at hand, but I really am intentional about not keeping that laundry list of every offense that he's had it because in my mind, that's not loving him. So I have to let that go. And in order for us to do that fourth pillar, we also have to let go of that list and not hold them to that. Right. Yeah. Maybe I'll just, I'll just touch a little bit on this fourth pillar a little more because we find it's the most fascinating one. And this is something I say a lot and people kind of roll their eyes a little bit, but I'll say anyways, is that we think we're very complicated and people are actually way more simple than they think they are. And if you look at people's issues in their life, we think we have this issue and that issue. Usually people have a few core main issues. Let's take, you know, let's take a husband for, let's say he has an anger issue. That anger issue is going to come alive everywhere in his life. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty clear issue. It may, be, it may manifest in many complicated ways. It manifests at work. It manifests with his friends, with his parents, with everything. But what you're going to see is he, that anger issue has been a part of his life for a long time. And throughout all the years, and through all his relationships, it's come alive. If that issue in his life is coming alive everywhere in his kind of public life, you bet in his private life is coming out much worse probably. So imagine this. Imagine you have a husband who says, wow, I have this anger issue and it's going everywhere. And probably the place where it's causing the most destruction is in my marriage. I am going to take responsibility and I am going to work on this anger issue. And I'm going to find a therapist. I'm going to go to a seminar. I'm going to read books. I'm going to go and listen to this podcast. And I am going to go full in to work on my anger issue. And, you know, you look at his bedside table at night, packed up with you know, these five books and, you know, and, and this flyer from this seminar and extra readings. And what you will see over time is two things. Number one is that by him working on his anger issue, not only do all the other kind of, you know, public places in his life get better, but he's going to see his marriage gets much better. And number two, which is most fascinating is that his spouse, his wife will probably say, whoa, what are the issues that I have in my own life that are probably impacting not just everything else, but also my marriage? And the wife starts to think, well, let me think about that. And she starts to take responsibility for her thing. And now you have her bedside table loaded up with these books on this issue and podcasts and blah, blah, blah. And what you have is you have now this, the most unbelievable thing of two people taking total responsibility for one of their core fundamental issues in life. And you're going to see the greatest place that will benefit will be the marriage will move to a totally different stage. And that's really what that fourth pillar is all about. Yes. I always say if each person commits to being the best person they can and serving the other, then you're weaving the basket and it's going to work. But if you stand back and say, well, wait, and I'm going to wait until you make this change. And then I'm going to do this. You get stuck. It doesn't weave and it doesn't work. You know, I actually have a personal testimony to that. Actually, when I started to work with couples, I got certified in the Gottman's method of couples therapy. And what I found was that my marriage was great until I became a couple and marital specialist. (laughs) 
I don't know what the heck happened, but it was like, after I learned all these techniques and words and what we're supposed to do and not do, then when we were interacting, I'm going, that was a, that was a force horseman. You're not supposed to defend, like we're supposed to do this. And, you know, it just got to be such a mess. And here we go into our fifties, poor husband's married to a psychologist. I'm sorry, honey. And I'm just, you know, <laughs> looking at everything saying, you know, this is a problem, this you need help with here and help with there. And so I went online and I was researching, what do you do when a husband has a midlife crisis? And I came across this information that said, do nothing say nothing. Don't protest. Don't complain. Take care of you and you do you. So I stopped with all my complaints. I stopped talking about what we needed to do or didn't need to, what what the problem was, what we needed help on. And I just focused on becoming the best version of me. And all of a sudden he gets inspired and he comes around. He says, you know what, honey, I had some insight. You did? Yeah. (laughs) I realized that I've been doing this thing to us. I'm like, Oh, and he comes back. You know what else? What? I had this insight. And I mean, it was just rolling in and I couldn't believe it. And I thought never in my wildest dreams would I have expected that my desired outcome would have occurred with me not trying to make it happen, but just by me taking care of me. I heard someone say that the, the problem with hypocrisy isn't that someone is a hypocrite but it's that we deny we're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem because when we can identify our part, what we're doing, then we can clean it up. I always say, I want to have a bumper sticker that says, I hate people who judge, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I, I find in couples work that couples will say, it's always about you. What about me? And well, what are we doing there? We're, we're making it about me if I'm saying that to that other person, right? Right, right? So we're saying, we're accusing that person of a mindset that we're displaying in that moment. And we're just so blind to it. It's just such a head trip that we do to ourselves. Absolutely. So keeping it simple, like you have talked about and having the, this approach to marriages, keeping it, having the foundation of gratitude, positioning your mind, which recently I was listening to a TED talk where this person was talking about the research on gratitude. And they found that it's easier for us, it's very easy for us to go from a positive sentiment to a negative sentiment. But our brain has to work so much harder to go from a negative to a positive. We don't make that transition. They found that people will transition from positive to negative, but they won't from negative to positive. So we have to be very intentional to hold gratitude every day because our brain is resisting it. And so when you get into that discipline, it does make a huge difference. So having that foundation and having the mindset of what a marriage is and what those pillars are, I think this book is so great for people that want to do some premarital stuff who want to prepare for how should I approach marriage for those that are newly married, who want to have a method to their marriage to build that foundation. And those that, you know, are in their fifties and, and have been married forever, which by the way, creates a big crisis down the road. Everybody thinks, Oh, you've been married forever. You're fine. But we have huge divorce rates between the 20th year and the 24, I think it's 18 to 24. It's a, it's a tough time. And so you have to go back and, and find where your fire was and just really get into it and, and start building that again. For and we wrap this up, I, I loved an, a tip that you gave once on something I was listening to about date night during the, the week. Do you yeah. recall that? Can yeah, you share 100%. with our listeners that little tip on keeping your fire alive during the week? Well, one of the things that we discovered in the research that we were doing was as much as everybody sort of knows that they need a date night, um, that they have to spend some kind of quality time with their spouse in order to keep the relationship going, it was an incredibly small number of people who actually had a regular date night. And so we, we just went full out in the book in terms of keeping it fresh about what you have to do, whether it's signing a contract, right? We, we've had students where the husband works, the wife works, they're both incredibly busy people. They're both under stress. They have kids, everything. They never spend time together. They never make that. They never do it. And we have literally gone out and said, okay, we're going to make a contract with you. We're going to write up a contract on the back of a napkin. And it's going to say Tuesday night is date night. And no matter what's going, you know, I mean, obviously things come up, 
but let's make it Tuesday night early enough in the week so that if something comes up, we'll make it Wednesday. If something comes up, we'll make it Thursday. But we are absolutely committed to turning our phones off, making sure that we look good, making sure that we feel good, making sure that we're coming with you know, our whole mind and our whole heart to that date night. By the way, if we have kids and we can't find a babysitter, then the date night is going to be put the kids to bed, change the lighting, get a bottle of wine, bring home a, a pizza or some Chinese food, and make it a date inside the house. The date is a state of mind as much as it is you know, where you are or what you're doing. And we just, we just found that that is, I mean, that just, if you're not spending quality time on a regular basis with your spouse, your relationship is suffering. You know, yes. no matter how much you respect each other and say that you're thinking about each other, if you can't spend that time and that focus and be intimate and have that type of a, a regular relationship, it's very, very, very hard to keep things fresh. You inspired me when you suggested going and getting a hotel to stay at during the weeknight. Oh, and mini vacations. Dressed... Peter, Peter did a lot of work on that. Mini vacations. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, people, you know, people always think about that. Well, if I could just get this vacation, you know, these, these, this week-long trip to Bali, it's never going to happen. You don't have the time. You can't afford it. There's a pandemic. Like, it's never going to happen. And what we find is when people can put these mini vacations, these 12-hour rendezvous, they both, they both working in some sort of city. After work, they meet up for dinner, a hotel room in the city, and then they breakfast the next morning and go back to work. It can do wonders for a marriage. Yeah. Wonders. And no matter what stage you're at, newlywed, to you've been married 30 years, it, it can be, it can give you a spark and an energy to your marriage, not just in the moment, but it'll continue afterwards. It is, it is fascinating. But it's a whole new paradigm. We've had a look at the idea of what, it, what does it mean to go away. I was motivated. Yes. I was like, yeah. I'm doing that. I, mm -hmm. I can say that after reading your book and after hearing you guys speak, I already felt so much more in love with my husband. I just felt I got in, you know, you just get into that mood where you're thinking about the marriage in a really positive way. So I just want to encourage the listeners to go to your website and they can get their copy there. I am giving away some copies of this book to our listeners who rate and review this episode. So please rate and review. And then within a week of our going live, I will um, announce who won those books and we will send them out to you. So tell us what other places people can find you and your work. I know you have a Facebook group. I've been really curious about that. So we have, we have a few things. We have, um, you know, you can, you can find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, uh, not a partnership. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, not a partnership. Those are really the two main places. Besides for our website, we can get some more background information. But the social media is, you know, that's where we're doing most of our stuff. You know, people often ask us, you know, so what, what, what are you trying to do with the book as far as, you know, seminars? And the answer is nothing. Our really our total goal is people to read the book. We really feel the book has such important information. And we feel that the other marriage books out there are awesome. I have them all on my bookshelf over here. Mm -hmm. But we really feel that the book is foundational and really deals with some of the basics of marriage. So our real goal is just to get the book out there and for people to read the book. So that there's no seminars, there's nothing yes. else. It's just the meat and potatoes of the book. And the more we can get it out there, the more we feel it's our mission to really make happen. Yes, I support that goal. My daughter just got engaged, so I'm going to get the oh, book for her as a present. <laughs> Thank right. you. Fantastic. Yes. So please, folks, come to their website. I have the link in the bio. It is notapartnership.com. Follow them on Instagram, like their page on Facebook. And thank you again for joining us all the way from Israel and sharing with us this passion that you have to equip your readers with how to have a successful marriage. So thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. Thank, thank you. you very much for having us. So we have a giveaway, folks, and I'm excited to announce that I'm giving away four of these books to our listeners. So here are the directions. Please follow my page on Instagram at Dr. Sean Horn and also follow Not A Partnership at Not A Partnership on Instagram. Rate this show on iTunes and give it a review on iTunes between October 18th to the following Sunday, October 25th, you have a chance to 
enter this giveaway. I will announce the winners on October 26, 2020 on my Instagram page. And then I will contact you through Instagram. I will message you and then I can get your address and have the book delivered to the address of your choice. So thank you again and please enter our giveaway. I hope you win. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. I hope this discussion was inspiring and uplifting to your journey. Please remember this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not meant to substitute a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Also, make sure you rate this show, share with those you know, and send us a shout out. Please message me with any topics you would like me to address or questions you have on social media at Dr. Sean Horn or on my website. Thank you again and may you find joy in the journey and be richly blessed.